past 7 o'clock, if we could please call the Marysville City Council meeting of November the 25th to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Stay standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Almighty God, we ask you to guide us throughout this meeting as we seek to make decisions for the good of the city of Marysville and its citizens. Amen. Amen. It's great to have a packed house. We enjoy when the citizens show up to talk about things in our city. Uh, it's ours just as much, uh, yours just as much as it is ours. So. Roll call, please. Nevin Taylor. Present. Jeff Rose. Present. Scott Frost. Present. You have minutes from the November 11th, 2019 session in your packet. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections that need to be noted? Move to approve as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Your minutes are approved. Um, next piece of business, the work session for December the 2nd has been canceled. Uh, that will be the Christmas walk and tree lighting this evening. So we will just stay there instead of looking off to a meeting. There were no items that uh, we felt needed to be on the agenda that evening. So the next meeting will be a regular council meeting on Monday, December 9th. At this time, if I could get Diane Mankins, uh, the superintendent, to come up front. Diane. Where'd Diane go? She's coming. And Stephen White from COSI. So we have uh, formed a partnership with COSI in about 20 different communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that we're doing this year is proclaiming a COSI STEM star. And this will be, ours is going to be Mrs. Mankins. This is uh, our first COSI STEM star. <coughs> So whereas in 2013, the Marysville Exempted Village School District was awarded the straight A fund grant to start an early college high school, and whereas Marysville Exempted Village School District Superintendent Diane Mankins played a key role in the school district receiving the nearly $12.5 million grant, and shortly thereafter she brought the vision of an early college high school to life. And whereas Marysville Early College High School opened in August 2014, making it Ohio's first manufacturing-related early college high school focused on the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Whereas Marysville ECHS is a school of choice high school that provides students with a STEM-focused, inquiry-centered curriculum based on real-world experiences. And whereas Superintendent Mankin's vision and leadership has resulted in remar remarkable opportunities, not only for students, but for our community. And whereas Superintendent Mankins has been selected as the 2020 STEM star for the city of Marysville as part of COSI Science Festival. And whereas as a COSI STEM star, Superintendent Mankins will serve as one of the grand marshals for the COSI Science Festival by attending the festival events in the community and the big science <coughs> celebration on Saturday, May 9th. Now therefore, I, J.R. Roush, Mayor of the City of Marysville, do hereby pay tribute to Diane Mankins in recognition of her outstanding work and achievements and commend her for her contribution as an excellent leader in the Marysville community. In witness hereof, I have set my hand the great seal of the state of Mar City of Marysville <laughs> and here to affix this 25th day of this November 2019. Congratulations. <laughs> background for those in the audience here today. Uh, COSI is proud to partner with the City of Marysville and particularly under the leadership of City Council uh, and Mayor Roush as well as Terry, the superintendent, and the entire staff here in the City of Marysville. We want to thank you all for taking leadership uh, and really thinking about STEM education as the future, 
Right here, there's so much STEM happening in the city of Marysville and in Union County. We are excited to highlight this amazing industry for our community. So the, the COSI Science Festival is an annual event. It's Ohio's largest STEM event. It's free and open to the public. So essentially what it is, is it's a four-day festival where the first three days are spread out across 18 different communities all across central Ohio, <coughs> including right here in the city of Marysville. The final day is what we call the Big Science Celebration uh, where that happens in downtown Columbus all around COSI, where we block off the streets and you have 10 by 10 booths as far as the eye can see with hands-on experiences that really highlight the amazing science, technology, engineering, and math that are happening right here in the great state of Ohio and right here in the city of Marysville and Union County. Um, so as the mayor mentioned, uh, one of the grand marshals for this amazing event that's happening is your own Diane, and we're excited to highlight her amazing story, what she's done around straight A, as well as around um, the STEM school here in the city of Marysville, to share that with the community at large. And so, as being part of one of the grand marshals, we are gonna be presenting you with this trophy, uh, which by the way is 3D printed, uh, just in case everyone here is curious, um, in honor of the amazing work that you have done here in the city of Marysville, and on behalf of the entire COSAC community in Central Ohio and the state of Ohio, as was mentioned by the mayor, congratulations and thank you for your amazing work. Thank you. All right, so we're going to do a fun science experiment. Who all here has been to COSI before? All right, well, hands up. That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to need your help, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you can stand here. Diane, you're going to have to stand here as well. Okay. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'm going to make sure I give you this. This is a Coast Science Science Festival t-shirt and a lot of fun swag that you're going to have Perfect. as part of your first official duties as the Grand Marshal of the Science Festival. <laughs> and, um, and I'm also giving the city council members these Coast Science Science Festival t-shirts as since the city is the official partner of the Coast Science Science Festival. So remember, all, every, all this information will be available on COSISciFest.org for all these free events that are going to be open up to you and your families uh, from May 6th through 9th in the spring of 2020. Help me pass these out. Thank you so much. So, for this fun, who all has, um, I've got three questions here that I have to ask before we do this fun science experiment, because this would not be COSI without something fun. So again, my name, I don't think I've introduced my name completely. My name is Stephen White. I'm one of the vice presidents at COSI. So I've uh, been there now for almost two years, really excited about all things science and fun. So by show of hands, who all here has done skydiving? Hey, wow, a couple, awesome. Usually maybe a couple of hands go up, but that's pretty cool. That's, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, who all here has been in a hot air balloon? Okay, who all here has been in an airplane? All right, everybody's hands go up, right? Well, if you've done all those different things, then you have at some point gone through a cloud. Okay, now for those of you who do not raise your hand, don't worry, today I'm gonna create a cloud for you right here in this room. Uh, so get ready to kind of have a cloud here in, in a moment. But I'm gonna share with you a little bit of science first before we do that. Now, clouds are caused by water vapor that's high up in the atmosphere that has evaporated. And it evaporates up in the air when it hits, uh, when it hits what we call it, a, when it condenses. And when it condenses, it hits what's called the dew point of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit which is high up in the cold, and when it condenses, it collects particles and ice molecules that form through uh, pollen and dust that you see in the air, and that forms clouds. Well, here in the room, we don't have that ability to make it that cold. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be taking this fun Mr. Friend, and we call liquid nitrogen, which is uh, negative 321 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty darn cold. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna mix it with this bucket of warm water. And what's gonna happen is uh, when, this, when this liquid nitrogen hits this water, it's gonna instantly cause this water vapor to condense to form a cloud. So in order for us to do this, I'm gonna need your help. Uh, if you could stand over here just a little bit um, and have us start with a countdown, okay? And I'm gonna need you to count down. Let's take a step back just here a second. All right, everybody, if you, if you guys can start us on the countdown from five for the entire audience here. All right, ready? Yep. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is a cloud, Diane, just in your honor. There you go. Your own personal cloud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for having this time here today at the City Council. Congratulations, Diane. And thank you to the City of Marysville for being amazing partners in science, technology, and education. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This thing's going to keep going for a while, so.
And then from December 16th to the 20th, while the kids are still in school, uh, we're open from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, so 5 to 8 p.m. on the 16th through the 20th. And then once uh, the kids are out of school, uh, on Saturday the 21st, uh, 2 to 8 again with an adult skate again from 8 to 10 p.m. And then from December 22nd all the way until uh, we, we close it down on January 5th, it's open from 2 to 8 p.m. And we will have extended New Year's Eve hours, which will be extended to midnight as well. Uh, it will be closed on Christmas Day. So that's the only time it's actually closed with the hours from that time frame from December 14th to January 5th. Uh, and with that, uh, that is a lot of our activities. I'm going to shift down the mic for some public service items. Thanks, Terry. Uh, an update on the Elder Park Playground, the, the rubber tile surfacing uh, for the playground will be installed this week. So once that's installed, the playground will be open. Uh, the Joint Rec ball fields, an update for that project. The, the work at Joint Rec for all the ball fields, natural and synthetic, is complete, except for the saw that goes around the perimeter of the outfield hasn't been placed yet, and we're waiting for uh, a break in the weather that, that is hospitable to placing sod. So that, that is going to be forthcoming, but the rest of the work is complete out there. Uh, I wanted to mention that leaf collection is continuing throughout the city, so that, and we are, it looks like, on schedule so far with all the routes. And then finally, the Christmas tree installation, we, we got started on it today, it's such a nice day, but it will be completed tomorrow. So uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, the uh, holy uh, erected Christmas tree will be uh, across the street at Partners Park. That's all I have. We do, uh, I might go ahead and state it tonight, just uh, since we've got a good crowd. We, we do have a new addition this year during the holiday season, and, and we'll be utilizing <laughs> it. Uh, we do have uh, speakers, wireless speakers in our uptown uh, that we will be having uh, holiday music in the uptown. So uh, when you're in the proximity of, of Fifth and Main and down each block, I know it's something that Mr. Taylor has, has asked for for a while. We, can, uh, we were installing the speakers today, Aaron, is that correct? That's correct, they started and, today. And uh, we'd like to think that uh, by the weekend, around the weekend, or in the, uh, certainly the first of next week, that you'll be hearing some holiday music. Now, we will be sensitive to people that live in the uptown, so we won't run it to the late at night, and we'll have it at a, at a level that doesn't uh, interfere with their normal uh, living. Uh, but look forward to that. I think it's going to be a great addition uh, during the season and enhance uh, everybody's uh, opportunity to shop and meander around the uptown. So with that, that's all I have unless there's any questions. Any questions? We have an update on the DMX track. Yeah, the BMX track, uh, we got 60% of it completed when the track builder was in town. Again, it's uh, one guy that builds it, and he lives in Oregon. So we're trying to find another time, uh, a window of time to bring him back. It's too wet now to do anything with it. Um, so we have to wait for some drier weather, probably in the spring. We will be installing the gate the, um, the first or second week of April. So the, the starting gate, we can't have any events until the starting gate's installed. So that gives us a, a completion date that we're working toward. Uh, but it, it's, I would say, 60% complete now. And then we'll, we'll get him back here to finish it before the starting gate is ready to go. And just since we have a big crowd, the starting gate will be used for the races, but our citizens are going to be able to use the DMX track on a regular basis, uh, daily basis. That's correct. When there's no events going on and the weather is um, uh, uh, hospitable for riding bikes on the track, it will be open to the public to use. Yes. And it is, uh, it's on uh, North Main Street behind the Marysville Estates, back by the, uh, the, the city's collections department uh, buildings. Any other questions of council? We're part of the council. I know that the Parks and Rec Commission uh, doesn't meet until December 17th, so they have no report. Planning Commission report. Uh, I'll be 
here today. For you and uh, it, I am Lady Maggie from the Planning Commission. Um, our November 4th meeting, we had two agenda items that were both approved. The first agenda item was the zoning amendment to Part 11 that was approved with six yes and zero no. The second item was the planned unit development, <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me, application for the Chestnut Crossing development. That was approved with conditions. It was approved five yes, zero no. Is there any questions? So you have a copy of the conditions for the application. For the second one, for the um, Chestnut Crossing. It was approved with conditions. Oh, okay, you have it. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen it. All right. No questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Design Review Board. Mike Lynch reporting for the Design Review Board. We had two items of business this last month. Uh, we had an application for new signage at 104 North Main Street, which is the Lighthouse Behavioral Health Solutions. We uh, had much discussion on the uh, design that they submitted. We suggested that, they, uh, that the applicant resubmit next, next month with other options and come up with something different. So that was tabled. Uh, the second item of business was an exterior and landscape application for a new restaurant, the Texas Roadhouse, which is located off Square Drive. Uh, a lot of discussion over that, um, that application. Everything was good and it was approved with the contingency of the Roadhouse uh, modified a landscape with the uh, direction of the city plan. That's all good to go. Questions? Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. I know we have a provision with the landscaping. Um, any real pushback from them, or was it just a different style of landscaping than they're used to as far as requirements? No, not really. Uh, they uh, they had their their original submittal. They did modify that to block the park a lot, you know, to screen the park a lot. But there was just some plants that really needed to be changed out. I mean, they had ornamental trees, multi-stem ornamental trees for street trees. That's not a proper street tree. Uh, we suggest that they mix up the varieties a little more. What they wanted to put in is what is standard in a roadhouse grill from the other ones I've seen around Central Ohio, but I don't know if that needs to be standard to Marysville. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Public Safety Public Service Committee report. Mr. Seymour. Yes. Uh, we met on uh, Monday, the 18th. Uh, there were four or five items on the agenda. There was a consent item for an easement. We will 
we'll be out there by 6.35 at the latest. We were out at 6.30 the other night with three items on the agenda. And we'll only be looking for items that can be handled with the change of our council to occur to allow them to get their feet on the ground and run. That's all I have. Any questions for Mr. Kelly? <coughs> Thank you. Hearing of citizens, we're at the point of the evening where any citizen wishing to speak for up to five minutes on a non-agenda item may have the floor. Are there any citizens here wishing to speak on a non-agenda item? So, what is traditional here is that our scouts get to come up and introduce themselves. Um, so, if you guys want to go ahead and form a line up here at the microphone and tell us uh, your name and how old you are, what school you go to, please. You're getting the communication badge, so you got to communicate a little bit. <laughs> I go to Bunsell Middle School and I'm 12. My name's Dylan. Oh. My name's Dylan and I go to Creekview and I'm 10 years old. Thanks. Yeah. So it's Troop 634 and uh, another tradition we have here at Marysville City Council is when you get your Eagle Scout. No, I didn't say yes, I said when you get your Eagle Scout. We bring you back in and give you an accommodation here at, at uh, City Council. We've got an Eagle Scout sitting here in the second row, Tony Ufinger. <laughs> I just got my accommodation. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll start that out. Who else, who else in the room is an Eagle Scout? Mr. White? About, about four or five. Yeah, I didn't realize that, John. I'm sorry, John Connolly. Couple up here. We've got a firefighter that, re that retired uh, from us. Todd Dispin was an Eagle Scout, so we big advocates of scouting, so keep doing good work, and uh, hopefully we'll see you up here after you've gotten all of your requirements. Thanks for attending. <laughs> no other citizens wishing to speak, we'll move on to resolution. Second reading public hearing to consent to the bridge inspection program services of the Ohio Department of Transportation to declare an emergency. Administration, we have nothing further. Council comments? <coughs> Citizens comments? So we're back for third reading title only on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Third reading public hearing to authorize the city manager to enter into the ODOT LPA federal local let project agreement for the widening of State Route 31 Phase 2. Administration? Nothing further. Council? Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve. Roll call, please. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Grove? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Rouse? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Five, yes. Concludes the resolutions and now on to ordinances. And what I gave you before the meeting to Troop 634 describes a little bit of the difference between a resolution versus an ordinance. So. Uh, ordinances are laws, resolutions are more like a promise. So make sure you read that information. It's good information for you. You get your civic lesson when you come as well. First reading title only, to authorize the execution of a TIF reimbursement agreement and developer agreement in connection with the construction of certain public infrastructure improvements in the Chestnut Park Incentive District and reimbursement for the cost of said public infrastructure improvements. Administration. Thanks, Mayor Council members. Uh, recently, for the federal work session, excuse me, I presented a, a summary of this TIF reimbursement agreement. Uh, this is for the Chestnut Crossing development. This TIF was a first approved in 2005. And what's being proposed is we would reimburse the developer for wastewater utility improvements, and that reimbursement will help the developer extend professional partnership. <coughs> Council? 
want to make it a point so that you understand. This is a commercial tip. It's not a residential tip, which Justin would show you if you came in and asked. Councilman, actually, excuse me, this is a residential tip that's been in place since 2005. So right, but I'm talking about the extra review because the commercial development, right. not what's in place already. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? We'll be back for second reading public hearing on Monday, December 9th, 2019. First reading title only, to authorize the amendment of an agreement previously entered into by the City of Marysville with Greenville Technology, doing business as Marioku Technology North America, for the purpose of granting a job creation tax credit and to authorize and approve related matters. Administration, I think it's going to be Mr. Phillips, Mr. Spahn. Let's uh, get the presentation up first. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Tonight I'm going to present a proposed amendment to the Municipal Income Tax Credit Amendment to um, or the Moriku Tax Credit that we actually did about five years ago. Now we're actually in year five in 2019. This is the Moriku facility. We're probably all familiar with to set the standard for the uh, 33 Innovation Park going forward. Um, a little bit about the company, um, it is actually the largest uh, plastic supplier to Honda of America and we were approached by them, uh, by uh, Greenville Technology actually to locate not only their R&D center but their North American headquarters in Marysville back in 2013-2015. We then uh, quickly uh, looked at the, what incentives we could actually do, it was a term we could not do an abatement <coughs> due to some restrictions so we chose to do an income tax in credit, that's exactly the direction we decided to go then. The um, tax credit basically was executed in December 13 uh, to support the company's $3.25 million investment. The company was offered a 75% 10-year income tax credit, and per the agreement, the company was to meet uh, three different standards. One, 54 jobs by 2024, $3.9 million in payroll by 2024, and annual income tax of about $60,000 by 2024. So as of 12-31-18, this is all done in rearage. It's based on when the company submits the information at the end of the year, and then you determine uh, the incentive uh, value that following year. As of 12-31-18, the company has actually invested four, almost $4.8 million, way above the $3.25 million. They've retrained 32 jobs. To, to give you some more context, the, the company was located in Marysville and actually, uh, was actually did not have any space left, and they chose to keep the 32 employees plus add the 54. So far, they've created 41 jobs with a payroll of 3.1 million net uh, new jobs, income tax about 143,000. We have made payments back to the company as a result of their success of about 107,000 and some change. So with, uh, just like in, in, in this TV example, if we had a tax abatement where we were changing, it would actually go through a longer process. It would first go to the TURC board, the Tax and City Review Council, and go to the, to the city, to the county commissioners for final approval. In this case, it was Terry, Justin, and I meeting and meeting with the company and discussing potential changes to the, uh, to the document. And due to business cycle changes, the company's desire is to actually amend the agreement. The amendment to the agreement uh, reflects these following changes, which includes new employees reduced to 40 versus 54, annual payroll reduced to 3.2 million versus 3.9 million, annual income tax reduced to 49,000 and some change, reduced from 59,000, and an updated agreement as well as future agreements to allow more flexibility in the job creation. It's pretty, uh, pretty final when it says you can have so many jobs. We want to give some flexibility, and we added that to that agreement as well. But with that being said, um, the recommendation of staff is actually to approve this agreement moving forward, this uh, amendment. Uh, Moriku has been a great partner, a big supplier to Honda. We value having them in our community, and I can't say enough about Doug Sparham. Doug here is actually to, here to make a few comments tonight as well. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to meet with me tonight. Um, as Eric mentioned, we've been in uh, the city of Marysville now for 11 years. I was one of five associates that came over uh, from our Greenville, Ohio facility, uh, established that, and have grown to over 70 uh, full-time equivalent uh, associates as of last year. Um, we're very proud of, of, of who we are, what we've done. Uh, we try to support the community as much as we can. Uh, we're actively involved in the United Way campaign. Uh, we sponsor baseball teams. We try to help Eric out when he comes calling to, to help uh, bring, bring new uh, companies into the area as well. Uh, we continue to try to upgrade uh, landscaping, uh, try to, uh, again, be a, a good um, steward of, 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 
of who we are and, and what we're doing long term. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the automotive industry is softening a little bit right now. Uh, the next five years, we expect um, that to continue to soften. Uh, the marketplace is, is doing that right now. Our largest customer, uh, Honda, is also doing that at the moment. Um, so we are not going to be able to achieve our initial numbers. We, we design and build our facility for 100 associates. That's still our long-term goal. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the business cycle of the automotive industry, we just can't get there yet. Uh, but that certainly uh, does not diminish our commitment to the community and uh, appreciate our partnership with the city. Any questions? No, but a statement. First off, I was one that got to be that day when we opened. And I say we because I look at it as a partnership your your company and the city of Marysville. They've been great. I applaud the fact that they're being proactive instead of reactive. I like the fact that the finance chairman they're coming in here and saying, hey, this is where we're at. I think this is a positive move by the company, by the chamber, and I think the council should be on board with it as well. Any other council comments? Reading public hearing on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Thank you very much. Second reading public hearing to amend part 11, planning and zoning code and codified ordinances. And before administration talks, I'm sure that that's why most of you are here tonight. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the process tonight. Um, administration will talk, then there will be council comments, <coughs> and then there'll be time for citizens' comments. Uh, citizens get five minutes per citizen. Um, we do want to hear from you. We don't want 10 of you to come up and say, I don't like X, I don't like X. We understand you don't like X, but if the next person could tell us something different, that would be good. Um, a little bit about the process for this piece of legislation. We are, this is only the second of three readings. This is the first public hearing. The legislation will be back on our docket on Monday, December the 16th for the third reading and second public hearing, at which time we would have two options, actually three options. We would either approve, deny, or table. From December 16th, it starts a 45-day time clock that we have 45 days to either approve or deny it because it was brought to us from Planning Commission. And as I mentioned, it's great that you're here, but what frustrates me a little bit is this is what should have happened at Planning Commission. This is where you know, the Planning Commission should have a huge group of people. Planning Commission is a group of citizens, not elected officials, citizens, who their job is to put together what comes to council. Um, we're, we'll end up doing some of the Planning Commission work, but, you know, when we do things, <coughs> when developers bring something, and Planning Commission has approved it 7-0, and then it comes to council and we go the opposite way, they look at us like, why is your Planning Commission not standing up and doing something? So, as we come forward with other 
things in the future, please remember planning the commission is a great place to start. Uh, we don't mind having <coughs> you all here because we need to, to hear your input as well. Um, at the end of the evening, the end of this <coughs> tonight, um, we expect that there's going to be a lot of good feedback. We want this to be productive and, and an effective conversation. And I'm going to appoint an ad hoc committee at the end of this legislation to discuss the ideas and topics that come up, the concerns. Hopefully that ad hoc committee can get together before the 16th and discuss it a little further with CALFI and OHM, who are consultants that we've hired. Um, and I'm not going to go into how long we've been doing it, because I think that's all in that presentation. Um, but if we can't get everything accomplished in that three-week period, we do have some time that it can drag on after that. The reason I mentioned Planning Commission is if it would have fall down in Planning Commission for six months, it's okay, because no time clock starts until it gets to us. So, just a couple of points. With that, perfect, Mayor, yes, thank you. you uh, first. Thank you, uh, as we're here to talk about the zoning code, as you guys all know, I uh, wanted to give a brief overview. Wait, Mayor, I don't make this anymore. There you go. Uh, so we've got, uh, to begin, we're gonna start off with the comprehensive plan, which really set this, this whole process in motion. Uh, that project was started in 2017 and finalized in 2018. Uh, also give an update on the zoning code overview, uh, compared the proposed zoning map to the future uh, land use plan that was included in the comprehensive <coughs> plan. Uh, and then we've also already decided or already received some feedback from some property owners and business owners. And we wanted to point out some items of clarification uh, that just to kind of keep and make sure everybody's getting the same information <coughs> that we're all on the same page moving forward. All right, so in 2017, we started the comprehensive plan. It wasn't adopted by city council until June of 2018. Uh, and, and what that comprehensive plan did was it laid out various land use types within the city and to be honest, outside the city. So if you look at the map here, anything that's hatched uh, with a white cross hatch, that's areas outside of, our, <coughs> outside of our corporation limits. So we're planning certain uses out there if and when it ever annexes into the city that we already have a plan for it and don't have to kind of start over from scratch. Uh, so you can see uh, yellow, uh, so Mill Valley, and then the southern parts, that's planned to be suburban residential, and most of it's already developed that way. Uh, we've got some areas that, that are orange, and that's classified to be medium, res medium density residential. Uh, we've got neighborhood mixed use, uh, which is located up at Cook Point, uh, so right across from Mill Valley, and out west out at the new Kroger site, and that's, that's designated as neighborhood mixed use as part of this plan. Uh, regional mixed use, uh, that's out at uh, out at Coleman's Crossing and out at Scott's Lawn uh, for the future. Medical District, uh, that's by uh, Memorial Hospital. Uh, and then Manufacturing, which is in the purple, uh, and that's everything for the most part from the airport south and west, or sorry, south and east along Industrial Parkway. Uh, and then we have the Uptown area, which uh, everybody knows the center uh, right around City Hall. And then they've even uh, broken it out into open space, uh, which is parkland, and a Civic Institutional, which would be like ORW, the airport, uh, or anything owned by a government entity. Um, and again, this isn't a zoning change in, in the comprehensive plan. This is just a guide for city council, for planning commission, uh, to understand where the growth is going to happen and kind of how it's going to happen. And as well, uh, as to inform residents and city staffs on the implication of the future growth. Uh, as part of the comprehensive plan, uh, if we get uh, a low amount of growth, as, uh, as our consultant determined it, we'll be at 30,000 people by 2040. If we get the growth that everybody's projecting, we could be as high as 45,000 people. So we have to figure out where those people are going to go. Uh, and as well, with that, we want to develop a unique vision uh, for the city uh, and then measure future progress uh, and implementation of city improvement efforts. You know, if we don't have a plan for this area way off the map, then we probably shouldn't think about extending roads or utilities out in that area. Uh, so some of the plan goals, uh, so all this is summarized, and, and to be honest, you can find the comprehensive plan on our website, uh, but for the most part, the only goal of the comprehensive plan was to make sure that the zoning code matches uh, what, we, what we have proposed within the uh, comprehensive plan. So that was, our, uh, that was our biggest thing, and one of the things that was big, uh, other than you know, making sure we 
create a beautiful built environment, let us embrace and preserve various old history. Uh, and small town feel, that was a big thing the Planning Commission, our consultants council uh, directed us here uh, about 12 months ago, or I guess it's 18 months ago uh, when this was adopted. Uh, so timeline, uh, and just timeline, and this is just to say this has kind of been ongoing for a while, but uh, we received qualifications from consultants that do this work nationwide uh, in February of 2017. We started the project in May 2017, created a steering uh, committee, uh, which first met in June of 2017. We had six separate meetings. Uh, we had some public meetings, uh, not only here at council, but uh, I think our consultant uh, and some city staff uh, were at an uptown Friday night event where we had people put uh, sticky notes on what they wanted to see in various locations. Uh, we presented uh, at planning commission uh, and at city council. So obviously this was a pretty big task and, and that's where it, why a page of it's devoted to all the folks that were involved with it. So we had council members, we had people from the, from the county, we had uh, LUC, which was our local regional planning commission. We had Dennis Schultz, a local attorney. We had the schools there. Uh, we had city staff, obviously. Uh, Eric was involved. Uh, we had some police fire. Uh, we had two local businesses, uh, Memorial, uh, and as well as represented from Ridgewood Bank. We had Philip Connolly from Connolly Construction on it as well. And we had Planning Commission uh, Design Review Board members uh, that were involved with it, uh, including uh, one that's a, that's a realtor uh, in regards to it. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley. And what Ashley's gonna do is go through some of these slides. Some of this was at the last council meeting, but I know there's a lot of new faces, so if it's repetitive, we just wanna make sure everybody's kind of playing by the, you know, that everybody's all in, as informed as they can be. Yeah, so the main goal um, following the comprehensive plan was, was to do the updated zoning code so we could enact that vision. Um, and as part of that zoning code, we really want to make it user friendly. Um, and to do that, we're modernizing, modernizing the zoning districts, refining those regulations, updating the definitions and the use provisions as part of that. So and when you see this, um, making this more user friendly, on the left hand side is an example of how it looks now. And this is from the city's website, the link that you click on on the city's website. Um, and then on the right hand side, it shows now there's, there's graphs, there's charts, there's, there's a graphic uh, of, our, of our building typologies that are easy and visually easy to understand. Um, and so it's, it really starts to simplify the code. You can go to one page and you can say, oh, here's my chart, here's our parking regulations, here's our setbacks, rather than having to scroll through multiple pages on the existing code. As far as the uh, proposed changes, so the current code, we have heard that, you know, this is, this is very long, it's longer than what it currently is, but actually when you break it down, if you take out a lot of the, um, the kind of divider pages between chapters and things like that, uh, you're looking at really a difference of only about, you know, two pages from the existing code um, to the new code. And um, as we said, the parts are a significant portion of that as well in the building typology graphics with that. Good evening. Um, as you know, our current zoning map right now has a current of 22 existing zones with several on map or on zones that we were looking at as part of our uh, new revisions. And what we're determining too as part of our new current that we have a lot of overlap zones within our city as of now where that can be consolidated as part of our uh, research, especially for TOC and SD1. There's only four uses that uh, separate both of those two. They're exactly the same zones, but we decided that as part of our ongoing uh, development to go ahead and consolidate some of these uh, zoning areas. As you can see right now, our new proposed zoning map um, is uh, showing 17 proposed districts. Now we are not going to the uh, districts instead of the old uh, um, zoning <coughs> districts that we were calling them in the past. We are maintaining four existing uptown districts and um, also to uh, um, go ahead and craft standards for our uh, comprehensive plan and goals. As you can see here, um, with our uh, comparison between our future land use map and the new zoning map, you can see there are a lot of the same details that you're seeing um, with the new transition coming over to, uh, from our uh, future land use over to the new zoning map. I know there was, uh, Ashley has some questions on that. Yeah, so a lot of the, like you said, a lot of the usage, you'll see the colors kind of translate. So residential, you'll see the same color tones. The manufacturing, you see those purple color tones. 
translate into the, the zoning map now with that dark purple and the light purple tones down in the bottom right hand corner there. You'll see the regional, um, regional mixed use in the red that translates over around the interchange at uh, 33 and 36 there. Um, so if you really kind of compare those two, you'll see it's all going back to the, the recommendations um, from the committee for the comprehensive plan and how we wanted the overall city to grow and the goals of that division. As far as the timeline, um, for Jeremy went through the comprehensive plan. This is related specifically to the zoning code update, which we're all here for tonight. Um, we asked for qualifications in March uh, 2018. The project got kicked off in April, um, just the following month, and it took about um, almost a year until we were able to get to a joint working session um, between planning commission and council, which um, all the <laughs> residents, business owners, um, were able to attend and welcome to attend to get their input at that point as well. We also went through a couple other um, public presentations uh, with a few committees, um, newspaper articles, um, and then we had the two planning commission meetings specifically related to this as well. Um, did do some Facebook posts on social media. You can see the little graphic up there in the corner as well um, to alert residents of that. Yeah, we did not We did not appear to get as much activity as some of uh, certain people's posts as well. <laughs> Yeah. And, and based on the feedback, this is the portion of or the remaining slides that we have are addressing some concerns that we have heard from uh, residents and property owners. So we just wanted to go through a handful of items. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ashley and, and Ron specifically on this one to kind of go through uh, our conditional use permit as it's set up in this uh, code group, right? Yeah, um, as you can see, um, you know, we, we have permitted uses and conditional uses as a part of our existing code and now our, our new code. Uh, within our new uh, conditional uses, always remember conditional uses are permitted uses just with conditions. And um, as part of that, you know, we were looking to uh, go before the Board of Zoning Appeals to make those decisions if people wanted to uh, you know, choose those types of conditional uses for our uh, new zoning. Um, the proposed with conditional uses it allows flexibility within our new zoning laws. I mean, we cannot <coughs> account for every situation that is going to happen. That's, that, is, that is one of the main reasons with code, because it's ever evolving, it's ever changing. And, uh, you know, we would like to you know, have, like, you know, know with, look at the crystal ball and say, oh, we know every situation is going to come, then we can write a code for it. We don't, but what we can do is, uh, you know, grow from it, add it to it, subtract to it, whatever's needed from there. And as you can see, our board of uh, zoning bills. Uh, stats are um, in our commercial residential cases, and then we had an 83% turnover rate. Our total commercial cases, this is stepping back for three years, uh, is 72%, and then our total conditional use request is at 82%. So, um, uh, you know, we feel that the BZA um, you know, is, is open and fair governing on these type of conditional uses, and that, um, you know, we will see this as part of our already established guidelines in our um, <coughs> code and, and going into our new Uh, the next one, um, as you know, in our last council meeting, we uh, discussed about legal non-conforming, um, which was a, uh, you know, we had a lot of questions from uh, uh, developers, business owners, and residents within the city. As you know, um, you know, we did talk about, you know, if uh, somebody's house or business did get damaged, they can replace it. At first, we were looking at uh, percentages, but now, you know, they can replace it on the same footprint. They look to expand it, um, you know, then they would fall under the new guidelines, and also, um, you know, one of the other questions that we had is like, can it, if I have a business, can I sell it to another person running the same business? Yes, you can. Um, those are one of the things we did discuss on that. And the other one was, um, uh, you know, the community, like if they're an expander or substitute with a different non-conforming use upon you know, planning commission or approval. So we understand there's certain guidelines that, you know, do happen, but if there's something that sits for a while, that you have to go before planning commission and get that uh, permitted use uh, still continuing. Some of the things we did expand <coughs> on is, uh, we did look at when uh, if the business wants to expand or build onto their existing business. Um, we did say that you know anything over a particular percentage had to go to planning commission. We decided to go ahead and do if you want to do 50 or 50 percent or less, uh, we could do that approve that administrative like the, our standard zoning permit. Now, if you want to go 50 percent or over, then that would require planning commission approval. But it does give an opportunity that um, you know let that business expand even greater than what we usually have when we had our sort of percentage you can occupy on a particular parcel. This also gives that 
business owner more uh, availability to if they want to expand it. And also, uh, we did do a, um, a non-conforming for inactive parcels. Revising the code allows non-conforming inactive uses to continue for more than one year if a letter of intent is provided to stand up the parcel in the process of resale. Because we know certain parcels, especially commercial, can take a little bit longer than a year depending on you know the market and what's uh, the intent of that particular parcel is. And then the last one is the non-conforming use ownership uh, removal requirement for parcels to be under the same ownership <coughs> for two years for alteration, expansion, and reconstruction. So we were adding those particular. Um, we extended that time where we did have one year. We are expanding to two years. Um, the next big item that we heard um, were some, some questions uh, regarding the village residential district, and we wanted to make sure we provided clarification on this so everyone uh, understood uh, what the zoning code is looking like now. Um, so as part of the comprehensive plan, you know, it was um, addressed that we wanted to try to maintain that small town charm and that neighborhood. Through that, um, we created the village residential district, um, and so we're going to go through some items that you know what what are required to go through DRB and what is not required to go through DRB. So if you're replacing something with like materials, there's no requirement to go through DRB. So that could be replacement of windows, uh, roof materials, siding. Um, um, you can do, for example, six inch lap siding replaced with six 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 inch vinyl siding of, of similar texture, so it has a similar similar look to what that wood siding was. Uh, you could also paint your home without the restrictions of going through DRP. What's DRP? Design, design Review Board? Okay. Um, in order to um, follow that design review, re review board process, if it is a new build, if you're doing a major exterior renovation or expansion to your home, that's when I think we'll come through design review board to understand what is going on on that property um, and just make sure that it's in keeping with the character surrounding that house. Um, so that could be new construction of homes, additions of dormers, uh, a change in a roof pitch of a home, um, additional uh, footprint expansion of the, of the home. And then if you're doing something like you're, you're removing all the brick from your home and you want to replace it with vinyl siding, that's going to require you to come to DRB as well. So brick, stucco, stone, or something of similar material, replacing that with siding would require DRB approval. And the design review board to clarify that they are seven citizens just like our planning commission. So they're all appointed yeah. by council and uh, they're just normal people like yeah. citizen boards. Yeah. Yes. Um, the other item on the village resident, residential district is that for um, single family detached homes, front load garages are permitted uh, within that district. Um, so if you're doing a renovation, you want to add a garage to the front, or if it's, if it's a completely new build, you can, you can do the front load garages there. Does council have any questions following this? Mr. Taylor. First of all, I know that you've done your homework presenting this and you've spent some time have we gone back to design review and planning commission to get their opinions of what our changes are? Have we talked with them and how do they do if we have? We have not gone back to planning commission um, to review these changes. Well, the next planning commission, they just voted on that first meeting in November. The next meeting will be the first meeting in December. So that, if that's something we can the council wants us to go, we can we can talk about proposed changes and we'll take that to the And it, it's and my opinion. It's my opinion that the Planning Commission has already sent it to us, and until we get to either yes, no, or table, that uh, we don't have questions. I don't think our code will allow that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's in our, it's our ball. And the um, reason I had to amend it, I wanted to know if there was something that they had. I guess my concern is that these people are all endorsing right now. Well, but if, if we change it substantively, then it has to go back, correct? If you amend their recommendation, it requires six council votes. You, you, can, you can change their the recommendation. They it just requires six. It just requires six. Requires six to do one. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, and that would go back. And <coughs> on that, um, I haven't gotten to the ad hoc committee yet, but there will be at least one planning commission person on that ad hoc committee. Any other questions? Any questions right now of no staff? Okay. Thank you. Thanks.
Any other council comments before we open the floor? <laughs> okay. So now we are to the point of the evening where the citizens can speak for up to five minutes. Mr. Smar, come on <coughs> up and introduce yourself for the record. Good evening, council members. I'll make it large. <laughs> <laughs> the mic's My name is Pardon? It's on. My name is Andrew Samara. I'm a property owner in the city of Maryville. Uh, I do want to commend Ashley. I spoke to her this afternoon. There was some clarification. I just wanted to point out a couple of things which probably got a number of people riled up, okay? <clears throat> and they come under section 1133, uh, 09, 1133.12. And let me just put into overall. This entire document was fundamentally designed for new build, new construction, and, and gross enhancements. I think this, this council would agree that the majority of old Marysville is represented from home, with homes 50 to over 100 years old. <clears throat> there was very little that spelled out anything other than recommendations to come design review for major renovations. Um, I think they did a very good job in saying, hey, minor changes, you know, siding changes, roofing, and so on should not come to design review so long as they stay within the characteristic of the current building. And I agree with that. And I also re remember reviewing the overall planning document, which was well prepared, by the way. It just didn't get very granular. Um, so I just want to point out a couple things I think most people are aware of. The city has a bunch of new residents, but a lot, a lot of older residents as well. And under the existing guidelines, it would have been cost prohibitive for anybody to go on and try to improve their property. I think the clarifications went a long way to help that. Also, I want to also make a statement um, as it runs into the historical district. And I know that some people will agree and some people won't. But fundamentally, an old house is not a historic house. Historic means there's something specific special about that property. As a matter of fact, you have a 100-year-old property that's falling down it does not make it historic. So the lengths to which the design review goes in terms of the historical district, I think are excessive. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Conley. Yeah, speak into, we might have to get a little closer to it. Sure. Good evening. My name is John Conley. Uh, Mr. Rouch, you reminded me I don't know how to introduce myself. I'm a graduate of Marysville High School. I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm uh, proud to have gone to church here, lived, worked, raised a family here in Marysville. I come to you tonight on behalf of Conley Construction, but also personally as a resident of Marysville. I would tell you that uh, I believe firmly that I have a responsibility to God to make myself the best version of myself. Uh, and I think about that a lot. I shouldn't be lazy in what I do. I shouldn't make the easy decision just because it's there. And I shouldn't try and make myself into somebody else. Uh, there's a lot of good people in the world that are good role models and mentors, but uh, God put me on this earth to be me, and by God, I'm gonna be the best me I can be. I say that to you to, uh, to let you know that I believe that extends professionally and, and as a citizen that that I have a goal to help make Marysville the best version of itself. And I think all of you would agree that that's part of why, uh, why you've run for office and why you're there is that most of us want to make Marysville the best version of itself. And we don't want to be lazy and, and just let things happen because they've always happened. And, and we don't want to just take the easy out because it's there in front of us. Uh, but I also think we don't want to be somebody else. Uh, there's a lot of great communities in central Ohio and beyond, uh, but they're not Marysville. And I don't want to live there. I want to be here. And, and we can borrow ideas, and we can be inspired, and we can see things we like. But at the end of the day, I think most of us in the room want the best Marysville we can have, and not something else. I've uh, often wondered, as I understood the document before us, why we're here, and been told the current code obviously doesn't work, so we need to replace it. Um, I would say to you that over the past several years, I've heard a lot of people complain about the current code, um, mostly about signage 
if we're honest, we've all heard a lot of complaints and all not fully understood uh, how the signage code worked. Uh, lately, from the business I'm in, the commercial side, there's been a lot of frustration around the new re material requirements. Uh, they weren't there several years ago, and, and it's been a tough time to adapt uh, for new and existing businesses. Uh, similarly, with the, uh, the setback and build two lines, and, and there's been a lot of people that said, I wish that worked a little differently. I'm disappointed to find that the areas I believe are the most problematic in our current code are more entrenched in the proposed zoning code. Uh, they're not resolved, they're not gentler, uh, but they're just through and through a part of the fabric of that code. I do not believe that any of those issues are kinder or gentler for people that have to deal with them in the proposed code than they are in what we have now. Uh, so if the reason we want a proposed code to be different is because we don't like the current, I'm concerned that it doesn't address the reasons we don't like our current code. The proposed code has been presented as easier to understand and more user-friendly to residents and businesses. And I think we'd all like a more user-friendly code. And uh, frankly, I went into it with an open mind thinking, maybe that's the case. Maybe I'm just afraid to change for change's sake. And as I got into it, I realized I couldn't navigate the PDF. It was big. I printed it out, and the 320 pages I don't think are user-friendly. It's big, it's cumbersome, it's complex. I won't tell you that I understand it and that there's points of it that, uh, that are good or bad in general because it's big and complex and it takes a lot of time. I don't think any of us will fully understand the proposed code until we've worked a project through it um, from whatever side you sit on. I have looked at it enough to know that I don't think that it is easy to use. And I think that most of the people in the room would fall in that same camp. Uh, I understand there's some good staff people that probably understand it well. I imagine that not the entirety of staff or elected officials or certainly citizens understand the proposed code before them. I'm not sure that the proposed code is reflective of who we want to be as a city. I think it's a, uh, it's a well thought out document for goals, but maybe not the goals the people in the city would have. I'm concerned that we've not in the past had a comprehensive plan directly lead to zoning code like this. So I think that the assumption by staff may be that we knew this was coming as a fair. Um, I've seen several comprehensive plans come and go. Um, seldom do we replace the entire zoning code afterwards. I'm not on Facebook, um, been told I should be. I like to play checkers with the kids after dinner instead to come to all these committee meetings, so I've not been to enough. I, I realize I'm out of the loop, but I don't think I'm alone. Uh, I'm not uh, complaining about the effort made, but just saying we don't understand. Please give us time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roush and Council, for agreeing to put together an ad hoc committee. Um, it'd be my pleasure if you're taking volunteers to volunteer to serve on such a committee. You're thank you for that list. I just haven't talked to you yet. <laughs> Next citizen. So, <clears throat> my name is Donald Berger. I live at 420 East Fifth Street. I live in Marysville's historic district. So um, I guess I'll play devil's advocate for a second. Um, you know, I want to um, bring awareness to my neighborhood is disappearing. Um, the houses are being devalued, and I'm being um, my homes, my neighborhood's being swallowed up by fast food restaurants, gas stations, vacant gas stations, auto parts stores, and other things in between. So, and to some extent, I understand why this has to happen. Um, you know, the story has always been just because you live in an old home doesn't make it historical. Well, that's <coughs> true. But the city of Marysville has an historical district that is designated by the city of Marysville that states every home within that district is historical based on the character of the home. Second, the city of Marysville has a national registry district, which was set by the federal government back in February of 1976 when the United States of America came together and said, America is celebrating 200 years. We want to leave something for the next generation for 200 years. So what that means is with all the structures and the character within those structures are nationally recognized as historical features that should be protected for not only us, but for future generations. Um, so that is um, the point I also wanted to make. Um, the next point I wanted to make was that the city of Marysville has created a residential um, grant where residents can come in front of a board and if something was done that they couldn't afford to do, 
um, they could request to have financial help. There's other things that cities could do. You could make a um, property tax assessment where people could borrow from their property tax and pay it off over a short period of time. <coughs> you could do this with commercial sites such as you know SIDS and other things like that. Um, you know, people will always say, "Well, this isn't Marysville." Well, you know, if we don't become a community where we protect something, if we don't become a community where we start visualizing our town. What is Marysville? Because you know, the reality is Dublin is coming. And we either protect what we like about the town or we gonna, we're going to watch it all disappear. And um, so, you know, I, you know, and so we have to become a community where we're very careful about sometimes in government, you know, not everything is done and not everybody loves what's happening, but it's a stepping stone. And this is, a, this is the first building block to that stepping stone, and now we have a longer road ahead of us. So I just wanted to make it clear that um, you know there's a lot of work that needs done. Um, not everyone's going to be happy with what what happened, but in my opinion, you know, seeing what has happened to, to my ward and other parts of the community, I am happy that we're finally as a community doing something about it. So um, that is my two cents about it. So do you have any questions for me? Uh, my name is William Wine. I live at uh, 424 East 5th Street. Donald's my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> we moved to Marysville in 2005. We bought that house. It was a rental at the time. And we put roughly $8,000 into it, which on a mechanic salary was quite a bit of money. Um, we fixed it up. We made a passcode. <laughs> we made everything safe. And then I raised a family of five children in that home. Um, one is at the University of Finley, one is at the University of OSU Marion. Um, we're a neighborhood. We're a neighborhood. And I can tell you something. I bought the house because of the, the elementary school. I, he could walk to school. And guys, the very next year, you closed it. <laughs> no, we didn't. I know, but <laughs> you, can, you can see the frustration as a young homeowner who really didn't have a whole lot of time. Um, I stay in my house now out of sentimental reasons. We've talked to moving to Florida. We've planned it. And then we back out because this is home. Um, some of the decisions that have been made, I question. Um, we had a light at the corner there where the auto zone is. It, it didn't seem like there was much thought put into that. And then it was gone, and then there was a crosswalk. And then my 10-year-old child got hit by a car about 300 feet away from it trying to dodge cars because they wouldn't stop. It wasn't her fault, it wasn't his fault. He just made a mistake. Things like that, they weigh on me. We have three families living in their cars in the Swifty gas station parking lot. I wonder how many people knew that. I see them every night. They live across the street from me. We go to check on them. We sent the police over to check on them um, over the weekend because we couldn't get them to come to school. And guys, I think we got bigger problems if you want to talk about planning. How about we plan something for these homes? We got, we got an epidemic of that. I understand the direction we want to go, and I get all that. But man, don't put any more undue hardship on an already downtrodden neighborhood. We're doing the best we can to take care of our housing. And I know the guys, I say hi to them. And they know they're part of the neighborhood, and Donald's part of the neighborhood. Guys like it or not. <laughs> but that's what I was wanted here. And I'm a far cry from it. That's what I feel like.
Hope Center now. Uh, the Hope Center is a, is a marvelous little program. I enjoy going over there and supporting them. And to the, to the comment of this fellow here, the one thing which I'd be consequences for them down the road may unduly burden the citizenship. So whether the design review board um, is, is a citizen council living here in the local community, in the community that is associated with that house may be more appropriate. And certainly I, I get the fact that sometimes the people that are involved in government may be a little too uppity for our, our neighbors uh, who are less active. Um, and that can have a detrimental effect on the more, um, the more effective of these decisions, like this fellow, uh, maybe, and the people who are living homeless in our neighborhoods. Um, I, would, I would hate to see us uh, make the most vulnerable more vulnerable, and I, w I would simply say that um, we need to make sure that our good rule for going forward also includes good rules for taking care of our fellow man and neighbors. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Councilor, for, for letting me speak. My name is Phil Point. Resident 16715 Rangey Drive in Darby Township. I'm a board member of the Union County uh, Airport Authority. I'd like to talk about the airport. So airport compatible land uses are uses of adjacent properties that are not adversely affected by airport operations. Residential development is most sensitive to airport operations and is always nearly an incompatible land use if located close to an airport. Some uses are incompatible because they actually represent a danger to aircraft using an airport. What are the primary compatibility concerns? With careful planning, development can be accommodated and even encouraged within an airport vicinity. Too often, however, local governments review and approve uses and structures with little thought of how they might affect airport operations. Local officials may, take, may make decisions detrimental to an airport, airport for a variety of reasons including the promise of substantial fiscal benefits from certain types of commercial uses, or simply an awareness on how a perfectly acceptable development in another circumstance can have potentially devastating impacts on airport operations and public safety. <coughs> there are three primary categories of compatibility risk to airports. Number one is uses that put too many people on the ground in harm's way. Number two is airspace <coughs> obstructions and uses that may interfere with actual aircraft flight or may strike pilots. And number three is noise exposure. All three items have not been investigated this time. In fact, communications with the airport have not occurred. Therefore, we find it's irresponsible for the Marysville City Council to vote on any zoning changes around the airport until it's completed. So we're concerned specifically about a zoning change uh, that was brought to our attention with the Chestnut uh, development and changing that to a high density uh, zoning. Also, as a reminder, the City of Marysville does not contribute financially to our public airport was a leading factor to earn Marysville a spot as the best place to retire, as a balloon festival, in Money Magazine. Uh, so our concern is high density housing at the end of the runway, the west end of the runway, is incompatible use of land. Thank you. And just so that you're aware, we have not had anything come to us yet on uh, Walnut Crossing, Chestnut. our Chestnut Crossing. And we actually have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday at 4 o'clock with the, um, I think Mr. Popio and a few others from the airport, so. Yes, our plan to. So, and I think before any of the other uh, housing additions, we've had some conversations, because we've also had some conversations about expansion and other things, so. We, we have talked with the airport authority a little bit, but that piece of legislation is not here yet. So we'll, we'll have conversations with the airport before we get to that. My understanding is that they had to have a zoning change in order to get the, uh, the Chestnut crossing. No, 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 not, not what we're doing here. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any 
Any other citizens? How's everybody doing tonight? <laughs> oh, reverse comedy show, right? You guys can look at my back. Members of council, Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Grote, I feel like we're back in algebra class in high school, but you know, I'm still bad at math. Anywho, my name is Alex Harrison. I am the owner of the Ruder Works Plumbing and Drains, My Electric Works, and as of a couple months ago, Bunsel Heating and Cooling, the Bunsel family has entrusted me to carry on a legacy of 70 years of great service to Union County. And I don't take it lightly, you know, to make sure that we're carrying on that excellent level of service to every client we come in contact with. I see the city through a different set of eyes than what everybody else gets to see because I'm literally meeting people on a daily basis. We're completing anywhere from 100 to 200 service calls a week in Marysville. This has been a topic of discussion from a lot of our guys. I've gotten actually a lot of feedback and to be honest with you, half the time I'm in the office, half the time I'm in the field, I'm always running around. That's what I get with all this gray hair being 30 years old, you know, but it's part of the business. My biggest fear is for the people that live in those old historic houses that are barely struggling to get by, that don't have the money to barely make a repair on a water heater. And I know this isn't necessarily the historic district, but I have a lady over on 7th Street, a $251 water heater repair. Her water heater went down. This unit is 20 years old, it needs replaced. She cannot afford that replacement. Now maybe some of you know me, some of you don't know me. I'm a huge advocate for this community. I give and I give and I give to make sure that we keep people's systems going as quickly as we possibly can and as affordably as we possibly can. This lady was literally in tears. She heard about this rezoning stuff, which some of it got clarified literally, you know, with someone actually coming up here. I'm sorry, who was the lady's name in the green square? Ashley. Ashley. When Ashley came up here, she gave a little bit of clarification to that, so I can actually explain this to this client who's lived in her house over 20 years on West 7th Street. This lady's almost in tears over a $251 water heater repair. You know, to some people, $200 is a lot. To some people, it's just pocket change. I just want to be sure that what we're doing for the city protects everybody in the city and it helps everybody within the city. I'm all about making sure our community is taken care of, but literally watching some 70 year old lady with tears in her eyes cutting a $251 check that I ended up returning back to her and just taking the parts for, that's what I'm in this for, is to be sure that we're making sure the community as a whole is being looked after. And some of these repairs on those big historic houses, as you know, you got a slate roof, slate roof's gotta go back on, that's gonna be expensive. I ain't gonna be a cheap repair by any means. Sewer lines, water lines, gas lines, electric lines, all those repairs are so expensive. All I'm saying is, is please just consider the small little taxpayers that are out there, the people that have been in this town, the people that have been in this community for years and years and years, who have been here, who have been a part of this community, please keep them in mind when you guys make this decision. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matt Mason. Can you guys hear me at all? Okay. I guess no. Um, so my name is Matt Mason. I'm at 12 South Circle Ward 4. Uh, moved to Marysville in 2009. Uh, my wife was a graduate here. Her father was a high school teacher here for a long time. So we came back here because we want to be in Marysville to be enough of a city, but also not be part of nature way, not be told what you know, to do within confines of what we are. And I see what this, a lot of this stuff here is doing. You've expanded this village residential district very big and all of a sudden lots of communities that did not have that and the reason we chose that house in the areas was because there were no HA restrictions so if I need to go ahead and you know change one window make it into two or change the colors of my house or things that I need to go to DRB and pay for those fees be conditional based on that and nobody else too so I don't want to have a house and restrictions that are basically dependent on the government there too so I chose not to go to Mill Valley for the same restrictions and it seems like we expanded a lot of areas uh, to include HOA style rules or two. So that's why I ask you to reconsider this and, and you know, table this or deny this to make sure you don't uh, you change that zone to where it's more focused on what you want to do and not include other communities as well. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. I live at 300 Grove Street, Marysville. I have been a Marysville resident since 1994. 
Um, I have lived and worked in this community the entire time. Um, a gas water heater bill of 251 would make me cry because I'm a single income family, so I struggle. What I want to um, say is I chose Marysville for a reason. I chose my house for a reason. And I don't want to feel like I'm in an HOA or being told I can't have a certain color of vinyl siding or whatever. Um, however, with that being said, what I would like to express to you is I'm open-minded enough to know um, change occurs, and I would like to volunteer to be on the ad hoc committee if you will have me. Thank you. Any other residents? Hi, I'm Phil Atkins. I live and work in uh, the Village Residential District in the historic downtown. Uh, I love it. Um, I've had, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to give a compliment to the format. Uh, I think it is, anytime we have this kind of, you know, codification, it's complex. You know, we, I work in government, I get it. Uh, and it is infinitely easier to understand than the previous code. Uh, my biggest concern, I think, uh, comes from both my professional and, and you know, uh, office and some uh, interactions we've had with BZA is on the transparency of the appointments to these commissions. Uh, we've got some really great folks on there, uh, but uh, in my opinion, we've got some folks that, that uh, may go outside of their uh, scope at some point. So, um, you know, I'm always humbled when I hear uh, the stories of the people here. And as a public official, um, I was sitting there making mental notes that I need to work harder to get to my constituents. Uh, so I really think that those commissions uh, and how they're selected and how they're appointed uh, and, you know, I'm a pretty plugged in guy in, in Marysville. Uh, this is kind of stuck up on me as well. So uh, if that happens to me, I'm sure that happens to a lot of folks. Uh, so uh, I would just encourage us all to, uh, you know, increase our transparency around how we appoint, uh, around we appoint these commissions and also what kind of oversight uh, do they have for checks and balances. So thank you. I'll answer your question a little bit about how they're appointed. Um, they're appointed by council, and about two or three years ago, when Chad Flowers, our previous city planner before his passing, um, he started taking applications because prior to that, it was basically, you know, oh, we need somebody from Ward 4, Nevin, can you go grab somebody? So we've actually now gotten to a point where we have an application type process and the city planner, uh, Ashley now, actually interviews the person so that we get a little bit more flavor of you know, what kind of background they have, what kind of knowledge they have, and then she makes recommendations to us and we get a chance to meet them. So I think the process is a lot better now than it used to be. Um, and if any of you ever want to be on any of those, Ashley is always taking names so we have those in a in a bullpen ready so that when somebody goes off of a board we go back and say okay you know hey this person was interested let's see if they're <coughs> interested so um, that's just a little bit on, on how we go about appointing those boards um, those boards work fairly autonomously they are supposed to be fairly autonomous they are citizen boards uh, we don't really have control over design review board. We don't tell them, you know, what occurs. I've actually had certain people who've called and asked me to interfere in design review board meetings before because they wanted it to go a certain way. And I have chosen not to call the design review board people because that's their role, not the political side, and so I, I think that they're good, and we just need to, you know, we'll keep working on our process um, to make sure that we're, we're putting good citizens on there. So, thanks. 
Any other students? Go ahead, Ms. Young. I'm here. <laughs> so I want to show you a picture. Now this is in the historical district, but it wasn't the historical district at the time. <laughs> For those who didn't hear, I said there's a house that I don't want to see because I hate it already the way it looks, and also there's concrete one in the same way the block house. I don't feel it should be in a historical district, but the process that was in place at the time was allowed. <laughs> Kathy and I shared this argument, so when you see us look and smile at each other, it's because we both agree on a lot of things. So that might be an old house. I don't believe it was historical. Okay. It should have been torn down. But I fixed it up. It's the house at the corner of 350 South Court Street. It was a piece of crap. <laughs> right there by 8th Street, right at the corner. Corner of Court and 8th. It was a piece of crap. It should have been torn down. But it's beautiful now. It is beautiful now. And it has vinyl siding. And it has three tab shingle. So just because it's in the historical district doesn't mean it's historical. And we shouldn't have to put a ton of money into these houses to preserve them. The other thing that I want to address is we have something about landscaping in here. I read this thing the last three days. I've spent my life reading this. On page 166. Did you realize that if we cut trees down, we have to pay $100 an inch? Did you know that? Oh, Ashley, could you reply to that? I uh, had a slide in earlier today that I removed, and it is for residential is not included in that. It says it on the last sentence of A, section uh, number one in there. And there has been revisions. Yeah. All right. No, it That's was never in there. Yeah, that was, was never in there. there. All right, and then the other thing, we have these PUDs. Now what happens after these places are developed and a fire takes out one of them? Where's the code for that? If we have the PUDs, yeah. they're, they're planned development. Right. All right, so a fire comes in, a tornado comes in, takes the house or the, the building out. Yeah. Where's the zoning for that? Where, what do we follow? It's already in place. What it's is it? it? Well, if, if, if it's in a PUD, if it's in a PUD, it's already there. Well, isn't that like a subdivision? And then after it's been developed, then what happens? It would be redone exactly the way it was. It would? Yeah. 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 If, if we have a PUD, that's what has to sit there. All right. Just now, with the zoning code change, one of the things is that we probably are not going to have as many PUDs. Is that correct, Mr. Totten? Yeah, that is correct. Um, what you're doing is you're looking towards regular zoning compared to the PUD with this set guidelines on a particular development. With this uh, new zoning, it kind of helps uh, developers get more uh, benefits to where they don't have to do a PUD. But also to your point, anywhere in with this new code, your house burns to the ground. You can build exactly what you had. No problems. None whatsoever. And in fact, you can can go, if it's a business, you can go 50% bigger, 49% bigger, without doing anything. But if you want to go 60% bigger than what you had before, then you do have to go to DRB and they have to say, yes, it, it's okay to go bigger. So there's a lot of misinformation out there as well that we want to make sure that you're getting the accurate information. If your house burns down, you can build it exactly the way it was. There is, you don't, you're not subjected to this. So, but the other thing is when you're reading this, especially when you're trying to read it in three days, mm -hmm. it's blah, blah, yeah. blah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's bedtime reading. He went on bed for 16 years, yes. he'll tell you that. So, and I've already asked Meg, and Meg has done a lot of research on this. And I think Meg should be part of your ad hoc. She definitely is. She just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> right, yeah, don't you. shake your head no. You're, you're on it. I guess that was my intro. Yeah. Is there?
Is this thing? I don't think this thing's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Okay. You just have to speak directly to it. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be working. Um, a lot of good work, and a lot of changes have happened since the conversations have taken place between the zoning crew and the engineering crew and myself. Um, they totally fixed the whole non-conforming section, made all the changes that make it okay. Um, one, one point, JR, mm -hmm. if your house burns down, you can rebuild it, but if you're too old or sick or tired to rebuild it, you may not sell it because the person you sell it to is not allowed to rebuild it. That's something we might want to look at. We run into that. Mm -hmm. okay. So, point. Um, Communication has been an issue. This was a surprise for the community. It was a surprise to the city that it was a surprise to the community. <laughs> I think that we have the ability to get the word out better because Jeremy asked me, what do we do? How do we get the community to know what's going on? Because I pointed out to them that for the first time, people are reading the zoning code and they're seeing stuff they passed two years ago they don't like. And I said, uh, I don't know. I don't know, Jeremy. I don't know how you get the word out. I don't follow Facebook. Uh, nobody, I don't know. Then John Conley mentioned something. Everyone gets a stormwater bill. Whether or not we want it. I offer to pay it <laughs> once a year. Nope, I'm gonna get that bill for $4.50 on every single property I own. So since we already have the mailing address, and are mailing something already to every citizen that owns, or everyone who owns property, why can't we put a notice in that mailing once a month? Hey, we're changing the zoning code. It could affect you negatively. Put like a cigarette warning on there. You could be totally screwed <laughs> if you don't come and see what we're doing. It needs to be a separate that, paper, not printed on the water bill. Yeah, yeah, or have an additional uh, attachment yeah. that can even be added. So that's not, yeah, we want I think and, that and one of the other things that we've talked about, um, I saw Mr. Berger had a, a sign from another community where a certain property was going to be rezoned, or, you know, they were had a variance or whatever. And where Mr. Emery used to be at Gahanna, they used to do the same thing. They put it out there um, with a phone number and a date so that people would know. Because as you're driving by, you see that piece of property. You know, we drove by Fifth Street and you know saw something that you fingers have down there that was going to get rezoned. It would sit there for 30 days before the meeting so that yeah. people are aware of that. So that's something that we're already working on to improve the the communication, so I agree with you. In this case, we have a few properties that are switching drastically. They're going from residential to commercial, or from commercial to residential, and those people are being affected more than anyone in Mill Valley, Green Pastures, any of the new subdivisions, and they may not know. Um, we probably should let them in on what's happening by mail, before this thing goes final. Um, I've been trying to call people, but I can't call everybody. Like, there's a little sliver of land I sold in April, eight acres, that the state of Ohio does not want. The state of Ohio surrounds it. It was zoned R3 and AR. I combined two pieces to put together mismatched land, so it's usable by somebody. And it is currently being rezoned to be part of the prison. They're gonna build a house on it. They really should not be rezoned from R3 to public use. It's not appropriate. And so we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't just try to make the map look pretty. We should map, we should make the map match. And it's part of this aqua right here. There's eight acres. You see it, the lines there that is a pie shape that has no business being zoned public use when an individual owns it. So there are a few spots there where the map should actually change. Um, we have no commercial on the south end. 
no place that you can go and get gas and hit the mini mart. And we haven't allowed for that. I think we need to fix that. Um, we're pushing growth on the south end, so we need to allow for some of that commercial on the south end. Milford Avenue, traffic-oriented commercial, we're rezoning them residential. That is such a change in zoning that I think we need to reconsider that drastic change so we don't affect the people who own that land. Um, the, uh, the largest vacant tract is under land contract to someone who wouldn't even receive notice. And I've contacted them to tell them what is up, but uh, they are under the conception that um, they can continue their construction business expansion in the area where it's not allowed. So we need to be very clear with that. And in changing from the SIC codes and not going with the newer NAICS codes, instead just using a verbal description of what we would like to see, I think it's critical that we go into detail on what those uses should be so that there is no com confusion. And someone can look at it and say, oh, there is my business. Not hope that the person in the engineering department at the city of Marysville has the same vision that they do of what personal services means. Um, to me, anything that I'm buying is personal service because I'm personally buying it. But I don't know if they feel the same way. So I'd like to see a great expansion of that. That's a good place to spend an extra page or two per district and uh, just stop problems from occurring in the future. So. As, as, as Deborah pointed out earlier, planning commission is <coughs> a place really to get all these and I was I shut down. Was they told well, me to she, be quiet. She was there. This, she she was 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 <laughs> I think Tony was probably there and Meg was there and I wouldn't surprise me if John was there. I, in fact, and, I said and, this and, isn't ready. And because of them, I'm sure a lot of this crowd <laughs> yeah. Yeah. is here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I tried to stop them. Right, and, yeah. and since planning commission, you've communicated with all with most of us, and uh, you know, and with Ashley and Ron, and, and they've made a they, lot of. They have been fantastic yeah. to work with and to explain things, yeah. and they're modifying it a lot. But all these modifications that they're making, right. they really need to get out to everybody. Uh, yeah. um, so what How what we passed at planning planning commission is different than what we saw on the agenda tonight. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we are going to continue to tweak it some. Um, and we realize that with this large of a lift, we're not going to make 100% of the people happy. Our goal is to make as many as we can happy. You know, I, I've said with Meg, there's a couple things that she and I are going to disagree on. Uh, like with the front setbacks <laughs> for commercial, and where we make you park in the back. She and I are going to disagree on that. I'm not going to make her 100% happy. I understand that. The other six might. <laughs> but, you know, we're working together to come up with what is, what is best for everybody. And it is a balancing act. So, you know, for some of you know, I'm a, I'm a fourth generation Union County, third generation in Marysville. My family's been in here over 100 years. Um, you know, this this is home. My family bought our first farm here in 1816. Yeah, so, you know, there, there are some of us here that are, have been here for a real long time, and we all love it, and uh, we also want to welcome the new people to Marysville as well and, and make sure that we can all live together. And it's difficult, no doubt, sometimes. Any other citizens? Hi, my name is Alyssa Campbell. I'm loud, so you probably won't need to hear the microphone. Um, so I'd like to first off thank Alex. So great job on getting the word out. Um, most of us are actually here because of a Facebook post, not because of a mailer, not because of phone calls, but because of a simple Facebook post. And Donald is really great about that as well. So you know, if you're looking for ways to actually get the community involved, technology is the easiest one, and it's free. Um, I would have loved to have been at planning events. Didn't know they even existed. So I'm gonna represent a couple different check marks on this box. Um, you have to forgive me, I'm a little 
irritated at the idea that because we're late to the game means that our voices aren't as important <laughs> or that we're somehow relegated, like we're out here because we were late to the table. Um, so I am that mom with kids that would cry at a $250 bill, but I also am a double, a double income household. So one way or another, we're all affected by these changes. Number two, I live on the outside where your proposed zoning improvements would happen once you start growing in a different direction. My home sits on acreage. I don't want a manufacturing center across the street from me. I bought that acreage so that I wouldn't have to look at anybody. <laughs> I like where I live. The same way that everyone likes where they live since they've been here since 1816 or 2007, like me. And I have that right because I purchased that track of land. I don't want to look outside my window and see a subdivision. No offense to all the subdivision people. It's lovely that you live there, but you made that choice. I want to live in the middle of nowhere, in the country, in an agriculture community, because that's what I want. Otherwise, I would have moved to Dublin. If I wanted all my storefronts to look exactly the same, I would have moved to Dublin. But I moved to Marysville because I like the small town charm here. I like the fact that I can go into the Dollar General and I can greet the people by name. I like the fact that I know the four homeless people. I know them all by name. They talk to my son who works in a local community that know him by name. I don't want to become some place that, no offense to Greenville Technology, that looks across the street at a manufacturing center and says, well, used to have some really good land here. I guess I'm gonna have to move to Ridgewood because that's where we're gonna head. And those voices that are late to the table are just as important as the ones who've been here since 2007. And it's a little insulting to think otherwise, especially when we pay our property taxes and have a voice just to be heard as much. We deserve to have a thoughtful planning process that integrates all of us, not just one person, not just the people that own property in this town, not just rental incomes, but people who are actually a part of it and living it every single day. So when you look at these, Please take in point that it only takes one simple posting on a Facebook page to get all of these people here, to get all of them active, to get all of them wondering, what are you doing? And why aren't you including us? Why aren't our voices being heard? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Emmer. Well, if we do post on the city uh, Facebook page. We have a Facebook page. How many of you follow the City of Mary's Facebook page now? So we, we post all the yeah, we had the oh, screenshot up there. We had all three, three shares and seven likes on them. Yes. Well, the Park Service would like to filter things down. So yeah. so, so, yeah. 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 I'm not a millennial, and we've got a, a millennial that's coming on council in January, and he says the only way to get a hold of you is Facebook. Absolutely. But I also will tell you that I've read a whole bunch of your Facebook posts, and a lot of them have misinformation, and it creates a firestorm of misinformation, so that's not the only way to, to well, get information. Well, that's why we're here, because we want to know the truth. Yeah, we right. I understand, I understand. So yeah. we'll, we'll continue to post and all we, meetings, yeah. even once this ad hoc committee yep. is formed, those yep. meetings will be posted on our and site. And they're going to be public meetings. And, and those, so if anybody just goes on our Facebook page, we will continue to post all yeah. public and in, in advance as well, and, and it outlines the topics that typically are going on uh, for this particular meeting. Oftentimes the agenda as well. The other thing uh, in the back, it, they're being videoed now by Union County Daily Digital. Uh, they are a free subscription, so you don't have to pay. You can go on and watch council meetings. And in the budget for next year, we have money available to put cameras in here, and we're gonna start uh, videoing all of our council meetings going forward. Um, so there's gonna be additional ways for you to get the information. We realize we're not perfect, and I don't wanna say that we are, by any stretch of the imagination, um, but we're trying. Any other citizens? Mr. Morrison. I'm a uh, local property owner and, um, and business um, person. 
I uh, pr try, to try to provide low-income housing for uh, the residents and semi-rental properties. My name is Vernon Morrison. One of the things I have to concur with Meg is I get every month my annoying uh, water bills from the city, and it would be a perfect time to put messages in. You know, you mail one piece of paper that can handle probably four pieces of paper for the postage that you're sending. So I think that's important. Also, I'd ask the people to raise their hand. How many people have ever been to design review board meetings here in Marysville? You know, my experience is, besides the attorneys who have to <laughs> represent people, <laughs> kind of have to be there. Have to be there. Is you, you have people that either focus on the end material. Um, you know, Pete Griffin, who I've known forever, would worry about what size tree you were planting, not the importance of the property. And you know, I think that and and, and council allowed him to be on that planning commission for way too long when he was focused on not what's important and what you're looking at. But I can also tell you, you get, so, you get the opinions of that count, of those people on that committee, which might not even pertain to what the city plan says. And when I've asked Tim Aslanier in the past of, of questions saying, Board of Zoning Appeals have voted something down that I've had. And you'd say, why? Well, they're supposed to be independent. But the, if we all think about high school football, you had the playbook that says, this is what we're going to do, which is the master plan. And then you had Board of Zoning Appeals that didn't do, follow what the master plan says. That's a problem, and that's a problem with, with um, Board of Zoning Appeals. It's a problem with um, design review. And that's the issue I have when you throw this extra regulation on. Alan Seymour can tell you years ago when they were updating the zoning code, I came to meeting week after every two weeks. I was the only person there. And of course, I give the view from a developer's business owner's side. And of course, there's a city side. That's at times in conflict, and I recognize that. But they're also trying to provide, where you talked about housing and affordability, there's a huge issue in Marysville that, that has not been one to address when you look at multifamily and some of the zoning where you, where you guys have made some changes recently, and I applaud that. But, but we can go back years, and I've tried to be involved, but it is very labor intensive when you're trying to run a family and when you're trying to go to do business meetings and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, any bureaucracy put on, I'm against, because it never really I don't believe you get the results that you're thinking you're going to get. So that's my opinion. Thank you. And just to uh, inform again, um, we do have a Union County Housing Task Force that's being headed by Chris Schmink. Uh, some of you actually sit on that. And we've been having some meetings because affordable housing is something that is a concern to us um, with multi-family two years ago three years ago we had 2100 units we've approved 2,000 additional units in the last two or three years so a lot of that is a supply and demand <coughs> issue so hopefully with more supply meeting the demand the the rate will come down you know When's the last time we said go to Dublin and get something cheaper than you can get it in Marysville? But that's what's happening in, in multifamily right now. The, the realtors will tell you that. Our average rent's what, $1,200 for an apartment? But if you tighten up your zoning rules, you're only going to create more shortage. Yeah. That's, you know, look at California putting the rental uh, controls in. That is going to create more housing. Yeah. Putting controls in is not going to create more. <coughs> So you know, I'll just say something like, as a, as a millennial, like affordable housing isn't something that's just affecting the Marysville or communities, it's all over the United States. I mean, the reality is wages have been stagnant in this country for a long time, and that's why everything is going up by the paycheck. And a lot of millennials and baby boomers, you know, they made money in their lifetime, but now it's not enough for them to support on. Millennials are the same way. We are not making the amount of money because of student loan debt and other reasons to happen. Like affordable housing is a crisis in this country. It's it's not a crisis just in Marys or other people. Like we as a country have to find out how we can afford affordable housing and is that government controlled rent prices? You know that. I mean, if you watch the national stage right now, you know depending on your Republican or your Democrat, it doesn't matter. Both parties are talking about it, so like this isn't something like this is something that everyone in America is trying to figure out. 
affordable housing has always been a problem, but the problem is now is that it's just like health insurance and everything else. The average American is now being now being hurt by the rising cost of the living in America. It's no longer the poor, so it's not in my backyard. Now it's all of us, and it's in all of our backyards. So that's the reason why you're seeing all these hot button issues now being talked about now, and they weren't being talked about 20 years ago. So, um, you know, so I think any conversation about affordable housing is a step in the right direction. Not all of us are going to have the answers, and we, you know, and as a country, this is something that it's going to be talked about for the next 20, 30 years. So. That's what I have to say. All right, for the next recession, one or the other. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Yes, um, I live out on Paper Barnes Road at this point in time, but I do have a number of <coughs> properties in town, but I kind of wanted to talk about something Vernon mentioned about, you know, adding these additional restrictions. And, and under the, <coughs> the minimum floor guidelines that they've got set forth in the zoning, was, it's set at 900 square feet per unit. So that doesn't contemplate smaller one bedroom units that would be be more energy efficient, more affordable, because you could have a higher density of number of units. So I don't think we're really thinking out of the box. We're applying that across all these different um, mixed use, neighborhood, commercial, the hospital zone, and village residential. So in the multifamily area, I, I don't think one size fits all is a great plan. It doesn't, it's not very thoughtful. And at 900 square feet, you're gonna lose number of units per acre, so it's going to be a little bit more developed, not as friendly for development, and it won't solve the problem with lower cost housing. So it kind of echoes on both of these points that were just made. I also had some concerns about the cost of the design review board fee, $250. It's only $150 per $500 to get a PUD. So, and then if you have, if you miss the mark, 50 bucks to come back, I think a lot of people get frustrated going to design review board to change, you know, and I, th I think they may have addressed this. I'm not sure I'd like to see it written in the code about the uh, vinyl siding and changing from one type to another because, uh, you know, heard that we can now use vinyl. I don't know if it's vinyl absolutely approved. Yeah, we won't put no restrictions on that. So no restriction on vinyl whatsoever. We're going to work with the consultant to okay. approve it. Because that, that was my concern. And, and and kind of looking at this when we brought this to attention was that yeah you know, I have a couple of buildings that have the asbestos shingle siding, right? Yeah, you know, I've been told it's not a harmful uh, concoction that's that's hanging on the side of the building, but you know at some point that material will eventually wear out, and whether it gets replaced with vinyl siding as an upgrade to that exists, I mean that that to me is an upgrade period, but if I have to go a step further. You know, maybe it's just patch it in with some of the hardy siding planks that are now available to mimic that, and you keep the same look, and it never gets improved from what it is existing because a lot of rental properties purchased as investment, and if it costs more money and, and there's no additional rent income to offset those expenses, why do it? It's an investment, and I think you would see apathy among real estate investors in Marysville to leave things exactly as they are paint them in the exact same colors that they are if, if they get a notice about flaking paint, but not to do anything until they're pushed. So I think you should look at the code as, a, as something to encourage these. You know, I like some of the ideas I heard about, uh, I think it was the tax incentive by incorporating some of these, maybe not appropriate for, for folks that are, you know, landlords, but um, to get some people incentivized that, that, that could use city money and then repay that over time through their tax bill. I think that was an excellent idea. So, just wanted to make those points. Thank you. Mr. Eufener. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, I just want to say that I am in nerd heaven right now because we are having a thoughtful, civil, intelligent conversation about the shape of our community and our future that's been going on for over two hours, and I've not yet won hear one person insult another person or call them names or <laughs> shout or scream or have to be escorted out by police. So well done, Marysville. Let's exactly. give ourselves a hand. <laughs> when I uh, was in law school and, and just immediately prior to that, I lived in a little community called Marion Village. Uh, Marion Village, we joked we were the stepchild of German Village because we were the community that you didn't have to go before a committee 
to get permission to change your house, to build a garage, to add new siding or put on a new roof. All of those things were pe things that people in German Village had to deal with. When you walk around communities like German Village and Worthington that are beautiful communities and very tightly and highly regulated communities, you walk around, you'll see a lot of wonderful old homes, charming neighborhoods. What you won't see, though, are the original people who made those neighborhoods <coughs> great in the first place. Why don't you see them? Because they have been pushed out of that neighborhood by gentrification because it's no longer affordable. I'm concerned that this, uh, this new code risks starting us in that direction, particularly with the village zoning district, the dark orange areas on your map. If you look at those areas, you see some areas that are prosperous, but I also see a lot of areas that uh, house our original tradition, what I would call the traditional Marysville residents, the mamas and the papas who grown up here, spent their whole lives here, maybe they inherited their home from someone else, and now are probably going to die here. And I worry about their ability to make improvements to their homes or to maintain their homes uh, when we start throwing extra requirements on them. I have another concern in that our, a lot of the pink areas, the light or the peach areas, the light pink areas that are commercial areas along Fifth Street, East and West Fifth Street, and in the interest of full disclosure, yes, my parents do own some properties uh, on East Fifth Street, uh, that those uses are changing, that we're taking a number of permitted uses and making them conditional uses. And translating that from uh, legalese to English, it means that people who owned property in those areas before who were allowed to do certain things with their property will now have to go and get permission to do the same things with their property. As a, an attorney who's worked with developers, and I know a lot of people don't have sympathy for developers. I don't have a lot of sympathy for them either, as long as they pay my attorney fees. But uh, they, uh, every time you add a meeting, every time you add an extra step in the process, you increase their costs. We end up paying those costs in the form of higher prices. Now, if we want to get serious about affordable housing in this community, we're on this, this task force. I appreciate and applaud your service for that. And, and I know that council is concerned about this issue. I'd like to see us create some zoning districts that are shovel ready for affordable housing projects. It can be a win-win for our community. We can take lighted areas, we can take bare lots that are perhaps within walking distance of our uptown, and we can say that if you are willing to build housing here, we will relax the design materials requirements, we will relax the tap fee requirements, we will look at tax credits, we will look at other ways we can make your job easier on the condition that you provide affordable housing for our families. That's something I'd like to see us do with this code rewrite. I know that a lot of people have worked very hard. I, I want to get an attaboy to, to Jeremy and to Ashley and to Ron. They took time to meet with me and with some of my colleagues last week. They didn't have to do that. Uh, they have worked very hard with me over the past to see several other developments come to fruition and they're very customer uh, service oriented and I appreciate that and I appreciate the fact that members of council, you guys do hear what we're saying and you do listen and you do respond and react. Let's take time to get this right. I know it's been a long process up to this point, but let's take a little bit more time. Let's allow the two new members of council who have been elected to be brought on to council and to weigh in on this process and I may not agree with everything uh, they have to offer, but the people have elected them, and we're just a, a month and a half away from them taking office. Let's let them be part of the process, too. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. And just to kind of piggyback on what Mr. Ufinger said, um, through that affordable housing um, task force, um, I threw out there that the, the city might be able to work with things. That's not something that's come to any council meeting. Um, as far as zoning for it currently, I think we can go forward without that. I've got two or three areas that I think would be perfect for that. That's why I brought it up at that meeting. Um, but that would be something that we could change in the future. <coughs> the other thing, we want to get this as right as we can at the beginning, but it's probably not going to be perfect. 
They're never perfect, and it changes constantly. Five years from now, we may go, er, we went the wrong way, we gotta go this way. Um, hopefully we don't do it six months later. Um, so that's, this is gonna be a living document that we're gonna keep working on. Um, as our old as, as the old one was, too. So, and, and I do hear your point about the two new council members. By the same token, we've got two council members that have been working on this for 18 months and probably have more institutional knowledge about it than somebody that's just thrown into it from the get-go. So, balancing. Any other citizens' comments? Are you waiting for last? Uh, I was. <laughs> they well, they they said a lot of it, so that saved me a lot of breath. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Conley, and that chick, and you know, a lot of you others, Matt, all of you. But um, something that hasn't really been mentioned. Oh, yeah. My name is Andrea White. I grew up at I born and raised here, a few generations, uh, my family, and I work in Marysville quite often. Um, and so, so this is something that concerns me is just what we're all thinking about, affordable housing. And one <coughs> thing that has not been mentioned is the existing low density multifamily versus what is being proposed. So. Uh, just as an example, um, let's see here. Let's look at village residential. Right now, we have about existing 10 units per acre, 18 units per acre, um, you know, double digits. That is being proposed down to eight units per acre. Uh, you know, going in the opposite direction there. And you know, moving on to suburban residential, that's Greenwood, you know, Terrace Drive, Milford Avenue. That is currently nine units per acre. They're proposing four units per acre. That's in half. <laughs> it's a lot less. Um, let's see here. Uptown residential or transitional. Um, that one, we have two and four units, three units. They're moving that down to two units maximum. So it's just heading in the direction of, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive to build to begin with. And when you're, you're cutting what they can put in, how many people they can house in that in half, there goes their, they're, they're not gonna build these things. They're not gonna make money off of them. And people want to pay money to be in walking distance of these places. People wanna, millennials wanna be in walking distance of uptown, of the Avalon that hopefully will be up and kicking in the next, Five twenty years, <laughs> you know, they they don't mind being on top. There's, they will give you money hand over <clears throat> fist. Just give me somewhere where I can walk and have fun. I don't need nine hundred square feet for my one bedroom apartment. That is, you know, in versus the five to seven hundred square feet that you can do now. So that, that's something that was concerning to me. I, I sell real estate, I help people buy real estate, and this, this is a huge concern to all of my clients, people who are, just anybody who wants to buy and sell in Marysville. You're gonna push them out, and that's heartbreaking, and, and also you're keeping people out that wanna come in. Um, these, these younger folks, they wanna be able to walk to all these places and enjoy these things, but the less square footage, um, you know, that's just, anyway, I don't know, I'm just rambling now. Anyway, so that was my main concern is just the low density multifamily, and I hope that gets a closer look and uh, gets some reconsideration there. So, thanks for listening. Oh, one more thing to add. Okay, so none of the districts in Marysville City Limits have ever been required to do this design review thing as a just normal precaution for updates and redoing their homes and whatnot. Um, it just seems strange that one area is being targeted for that. So I, I get that that's the area that we have some really cool old houses and I think a 
a large majority of us want to keep those really cool, already labeled historical houses. But as it's been mission, mentioned before, I mean, just because it's old doesn't mean, you know, that it has sig historical significance. And we don't want those people living in those areas to all be forced into making their home historically significant when it wasn't when they bought it. So thank you. Any other citizens? Can I use my last 30 seconds? Sure. <laughs> I think it's important that the community understand that the proposed zoning code doesn't have an equivalent to the R4 and R5 zoning we have now. As a property owner of a vacant R4 parcel, I now have a retail office parcel. I can't take the risk to go to BZA and see if they'll let me build the apartments on it that it's currently zoned for. So we're going to lose more housing when we lose those. It's just not worth the risk. We talk a lot about developers and their profit. In the budget for that project, as I've developed it before, we uh, told the architect last week, stop. We don't want any more bills until we know if we can do it. We have approximately $250 per month that will be amortized into the cost of the rent that our tenant would pay us that will pay off the cost of the fees that we pay to the city up front at the beginning. We're reaching a point where a developer will make less on a project over the, the, uh, the project's amortization of the loan than the city's fees will on the front side. So it's important for people to understand we're going to reduce the potential for new multifamily housing by eliminating those districts, and the fee structure already is a pretty strong burden against wanting to take that risk. Thank you. Any other citizens? So back to the ad hoc committee. Um, I had already talked to Mr. Seymour and Donald Berger. Meg, since you've been involved the whole way, um, I would like for you to be one of the real estate representatives. Um, Jim Wimmers would be another real estate representative. Lainey Mangy, who uh, is our planning commission person, uh, already said that she would be. Mr. Ufinger, I didn't get a chance to talk to you before the meeting, but would you be willing to be on there? Count me in. <coughs> Mr. Conley? Yes, sir. Uh, Tom Wisemiller, who is Eric Phillips' second in command, um, one of our new economic development people. We'd like somebody from economic development to be on that team. Um, and Tom's focus is going to be a little bit more Marysville, um, as Eric is taking care of not just Marysville, but all of Union County as well. Uh, obviously, Calfi and OHM, who are the ones, our consultants, they're the ones that are going to lead the meeting. So, I admit, I did not write down Mrs. Wilson. Yes. I don't think she's back there yeah. anymore. Kim is your first Kim. And then obviously Ron and, and uh, Ashley will be on there. So the hope with that committee is that we can take the ideas that have been brought up, the concerns that uh, Meg has brought up prior, uh, which we've answered a lot of them and, and made some adjustments, <coughs> and, and some of those things have disappeared. Again, we may. We may get to a point where we can't say yes to all of it, but we're going to use our best practices, uh, talk about it a little bit more civilly. I agree with you, Tony. It's great to be able to have a civil conversation. We didn't have to have Channel 6 or Channel 4 here carrying people out or anything like that. So, um, And we'll, the 16th of December, we will be back. We will find out. You should actually probably formally go. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Um, and we will we will put out information on our Facebook page after that group has met. Okay, so whenever that, uh, or actually before they meet, we will put the date out there because that is an open meeting. You are more than welcome to attend. Um, Calfi and, and OHM will lead that. Um, but just because you're not on the 
ad hoc committee doesn't mean you can't be there. Definitely be there if you have any additional concerns. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I move to table this date, Pacific 1216, for our next hearing and your report of this committee can come after the first meeting after they've been. What was that? <laughs> Basically, it's what Tim and I just made contact. Okay. Table no, we're just tabling it to the 16th. Correct. Don't say anything the rest of that because we may actually vote on it on the 16th. Is that okay with you? My thought would be you have appointed the committee, why not give them a right to talk? I don't know if they can get together as a committee and give you that information yeah. before the 16th. Hopefully. As a, as a member of the committee, it might take us a few times to get, mm -hmm. yeah. not just one meeting. Yeah. And I think, given it's the holidays, yeah. some people travel, I think you're hoping to move heaven, heaven and earth to vote on this on December 16th. I'm not, I don't, we're going to leave it as we, were, we can uh, bring it back on the 16th. We can vote for it or we can table it at that time. Right. It needs to be on the 16th because it's advertised as a public because hearing. Because it's advertised as a public hearing. hearing. We, can't, we can't move that. Um, and then the committee, if the committee meets before that, maybe Mr. President, you might want to just appoint an interim chair. We can maybe be in contact with the clerk and maybe they can sort of set up the set up a meeting if they want to meet before the 16th. And then you can, and the committee can report on the 16th as to the status of their discussions and the council wants to table further than yeah, I mean, third, third reading is a public hearing, and, and it would normally come up for a vote at that time. Okay. Um, we were going to have OHM and Kalfi lead the discussion. So I don't know that I want, when you're saying chairman, can we just use Ashley and Ron to? Well, maybe, maybe the clerk can just reach out to okay. some of the members yeah. and, and try to uh, organize, organize the meeting. The meeting. Yes. Uh, you know, between now and the 16th. Yeah. And if we can, terrific. If it bleeds over, it bleeds over. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a motion to table until December 16th, 2019. Roll call, please. Mr. Gross? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Rausch? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Five, yes. You're more than welcome to stay for the rest of it. It's not going to take long. Enough. <coughs> Second reading public hearing. Declare the improvement of certain real property located in the city of Marysville, Ohio, to be a public purpose to declare such property to be exempt from real property taxation. To designate public improvements to be made that will benefit such property. To require annual service payments in lieu of taxes. To authorize the execution of a service payment agreement. And to establish a municipal public improvement tax increment. Uh, administration? Uh, just a reminder that the third grade was waived. Uh, yes. So, uh, not mm -hmm. This is the Woodside tip for any of you that were interested. Council comments? Citizens comments? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve as presented. Roll call, please. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Rausch? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. 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 Fine, yeah. Second reading public hearing to accept the dedication of a drainage easement from Square Drive Properties. Administration? Nothing further. Council? Citizens? This will be back for third reading title only on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Second reading public hearing to accept the dedication of utility easement from Jerome One Associates LTV. This is yeah, this is that talk out 161 Taco Bell easement. Council, any comments? Citizens' comments? We'll be back for third reading title only on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Second reading public hearing to authorize appropriation transfers, additional appropriations, reduction in appropriations, and modify the 2019 annual budget. Administration? Nothing further. Council comments? Citizens' comments? We'll be back for third reading title only on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Third reading title only to adopt a capital budget for 2020. Administration? No. Council? Move to approve as presented. Roll call, please. Mr. Rausch? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Rose? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Third reading title only to adopt an annual operating budget.
budget for 2020. Administration, nothing. Council? Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Yes. Third reading to adopt annual appropriations for 2020. Administration? Nothing. Council? <laughs> Roll call, please. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Five, yes. Third reading title only to amend ordinance 42-19 annual compensation for all city employees for year 2020. Administration? Nothing further. Council? Motion by Mr. Brock. Roll call, please. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Mr. Seymour? Mr. Taylor? Yes. Five, yes. Third reading title only to accept the dedication of the Woodbine Village Section 1, Phase 1 Public Infrastructure. Administration? Nothing. Council? Roll call, please. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Grove? Yes. Five, yes. Third reading title only to accept the dedication of the Woodbine Village Section 1 Phase 2 Public Infrastructure. Administration? Nothing. Council? Motion to pass the legislation? So moved. Roll call, please. Mr. Rauch? Yes. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Crow? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Five, yes. Third reading title only to accept the dedication of the Woodbine Village Section 2 Public Infrastructure. Administration? Nothing. Perfect. Council? Motion to pass the legislation. So moved. Roll call, please. Mr. Seymour? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Grove? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Rauch? Yes. Five, yes. Third reading title only to accept the dedication of the Weaver Ridge Phase 1 Public Infrastructure. Administration? Nothing. Yeah. Council? Motion to pass the legislation. So moved. Roll call, please. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Grove? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Rauch? Yes. Yeah. Five, yeah. <coughs> Third reading title only to accept the dedication of the Eversol Run Neighborhood Section 2 Water Main Improvements. Administration? Nothing further. Council? Approved as presented. Roll call, please. Mrs. Grove? Yes. Mr. Brock? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Grove? Yes. Five, yes. Yeah. Third reading title only to accept the Session. Now to comments. We get to go first because it's an odd month. This is your own. Ladies first. Number one, as opposed to Facebook and cameras, I prefer face to face communications. And I always will. And I am sitting up straight. <laughs> <laughs> I also prefer my city dollars to be spent on positive, concrete advantage like more police officers, more firemen. These, these are values to me as opposed to allowing and encouraging people not to show up, not to be part of the solution, and, and be very critical of some outcomes. I do not blame anybody for being late to anything. I just encourage you to come to the game at whatever level. One of the things I've done for 12 years, I'll continue to do, is every first Tuesday I have a ward meeting in um, Marysville Public Library, which is a very calm, collected, um, no, I'm not an uppy kind of person, and there is no intimidation at that venue. Please, come and talk to the people who care about you, not just the people who you elected, but the staff who worked with us to do these things. So number one, I don't mean to ramble. As opposed to Facebook and cameras, come and talk to us, pick up the phone. Our telephone numbers are covered with information. You're not hiding behind a computer. You're coming to me and say, Deb, this is how I feel about it. Number two, come to me at the ward three meeting every first Tuesday. You don't have to be a ward three resident to come to a more informal venue and say, hey, Deb, what board can I get on? I started this business in 2001 when I saw my empty nesting come to it. And I said, what am I gonna do? So I started by coming to council and sitting there and saying, how can I help? How can I be on a board? And that was literally the way I said, wow, I'm gonna do this. So please, folks, become involved. And, and I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir, so you're still involved. People who left 
are one issue people. That's not how we serve our city. Come and talk to me. Ward 3, every first Tuesday, 6.30, Marysville Public Library. Sorry I'm off my soapbox. Okay. Mr. Taylor. Uh, first of all, for all those that are here tonight for the first time, <coughs> congratulations, you showed you care. I'm going to echo one comment in this group, and I'm both of us as former educators. Personally, I don't like Facebook. Personally, I think it's a garbage machine, and sometimes it spreads more rumors than it does truth. Now, is it a good place to say, hey, we got a meeting, here's the points that's coming up? Yes. If it gets a full room like this for every council meeting in 2020, then a part of my expression as a minister, but hell yeah, let's do it. Um, that's to prove that this old ball can learn new tricks. But more importantly, this is home. For 40 years, this has been home. Whether I was at Seventh and Oak or sitting on West Fifth Street, I'll never change from that. And if we can't get to a point where we can't say it's a homeowner's choice, then we're in trouble. That's not what the government is for. Uh, not too many people realize this, obviously, because very seldom they come in, but from six to seven, every council meeting or finance meeting, I'm here an hour ahead of time, here to talk. I got two years, I listen better than I talk. But I will say this to you, God bless, Happy Thanksgiving, and if you're traveling, be careful, because we're not going to get the best of weather, but I want you back in town Sunday by 1230, because we line up for the Christmas parade, and I hope <coughs> you never take the word Christ out of Christmas, because it's important. That's the real reason for the season. Although we sit down and eat and gorge ourselves on Thursday, we start a special season starting Sunday. Parade will pull out at 2 o'clock and we'll be in the downtown by 2.15. If you're trying to set your timing, the biggest thing is come, it's our community, and let's start the season right. Thank you. Mr. Brock. Um, quickly, I wanted to say that I, I appreciated the, the voices that we heard tonight. I think that this is an important venue, uh, whether you made it to planning commission meetings or the other public meetings or not. Uh, it's neither here nor there. We'll certainly work on communication moving forward and get that word out. Regardless of that, I appreciate the folks that took the time to come um, and, and talk to us tonight. These are all good things that the city council and city staff needs to hear. Uh, but what I don't want to be lost is there's a couple of you that talked about your interactions with staff and, and how good um, those interactions were. And so I want to applaud uh, Jeremy and Ron and Ashley and the rest of the staff. This is not an easy thing to go through. This is a very long, tedious, difficult process sometimes as public servants, we put ourselves out there uh, you know, to, to hear the folks that say, hey, look, this isn't right, and, and you should tell us that. Uh, but at the same time, we have people that are working really, really hard to get it right and working really hard to listen to you, and working really hard to be um, good stewards of your public dollars, and I know that those individuals uh, are. So thank you for coming and talking tonight. Thank you for sharing uh, your concerns and your ideas. Um, and thank you to staff. I think you guys have done a great job and we'll continue to do that. So thank you. Mr. Seymour, how can you put simple? Have a great Thanksgiving, watch some good football games, <laughs> and buy local. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I've got four things kind of to piggyback on what Mr. Brock said. Again, thank you all for coming, for expressing your passion for Marysville. We all love it here. That's why we're here. Um, I'm going to die here. My dad died here. My grandpa died here. Um, we are going through a growth time. And with growth comes change. Change is difficult sometimes. Um, but everybody talks about smart growth. And one of the ways to smart growth is through zoning. Um, so we appreciate every all the input and we're going to take all of it into account and continue having discussions. We're not in a rush to get it done. We've been at it for a long time. By the same token, I don't want to kick the can down the road. This isn't the federal government. This is the local government. We're going to get something done here. Um, and whether it's this year or early next year, we're going to get it done and we're going to get a product that is the best for the most people and then uh, if we need to tweak it, we can tweak it from there. Uh, 
Uh, second thing, congratulations to Marysville High School. They are hosting a state semifinal football game this Saturday night, 7 o'clock, Cincinnati, Wyoming versus Clyde. So they hosted a second round game, a Division I game. They're hosting a state semifinal game. So that new stadium is uh, getting people to come to Marysville. And there's a very good chance that, especially from Cincinnati, some of those people may come Friday night and spend the night, or stay Saturday night and spend the night in our hotels, in our restaurants. And spend local. And spend local. We're getting to that one. Um, there was an article in today's paper. I know everybody cringes when you mention water and sewer. Yes, we realize they're a little high. Actually, the water's not bad. The sewer's what's high in Marysville right now. There's an article in today's paper about Columbus. They're raising their rates 3%. We're not raising our rates. In a few more years, five to seven years, we're going to be very level with what Columbus residents are paying because we don't have to raise our rates. We've already gone through the EPA issues that they're now facing. So as they're spending money to upgrade their stuff, we've already done it. Um, so we realize that we're a little above the market, but we're getting closer and closer every year. The third thing, as Mr. Seymour said, buy local Saturday. Doesn't only have to be the day that Ohio State beats Michigan from 12 to 3.30, but before 12 and after 3.30, go uptown. We've got some great shops up there. It's buy local weekend. Saturday is shop local. Make sure that you are buying at your local store. We have a choice. I, I go to McCullough's because I have a choice. And I know the, the uh, Fitzgerald's. I went to school with them. I go to Hall's Creamery. I go to restaurants uptown. I go to businesses uptown. You have a choice. Make sure you exercise it and shop local. I got nothing else. Mr. Emory, it's your just, turn. Just to piggyback on that a little bit, let me give you some details. It is to support your uptown businesses by coming out Saturday. Uh, they're having a passport shopping event. Pick up your shopping passport at the welcome tent on the corner of 5th and Main Street starting at 10 a.m. Shop all day and get stamps from businesses along the way. When you are done shopping, drop your passport off at the welcome tent any time before 5 and be entered to win one of many great prizes from the participating businesses. Uh, drawings will begin at 5 p.m. Saturday evening, and of course they hope to see a lot of people there. So thanks, Jeremy, for being that forward. And I, did you guys, uh, can I, anything to add to that? No, you did perfect. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. so, so just uh, to know, and I also, you know, wanted to add, you know, what a, you know, what a great night tonight, you guys. I mean, it was, uh, I don't want to echo what Tony was talking about or anything else, but you know, this is, this is what it is about. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, we took notes tonight, I want everybody to know. Staff was taking notes on everything that was said, this meeting's recorded, so nothing is lost from what was mentioned and stated tonight, and, and we will continue to evaluate everything that's been done. And of course, the ad hoc committee will be very involved in determining next steps and all that, all that good stuff. So, with that, I'll, I'll close my comments. I take a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, you're staying here. <laughs>